Okay, so this next module that we're going to cover, this is actually going to be the last one that we will have for this class, uh, module 10, which is on something called normal distribution. So normal distribution is basically a manner in which data is um, compiled and grouped together. So if a group of data follows normal distribution, if we were to plot it in a graph, it would look something like this, okay? You can see that all of the data is symmetric, um, because it follows this curve here. If we cut this in half, the value that we have up here at the maximum is going to be both the mean and the median. So 50% of the data is going to be below that uh, dotted line, 50% of the data is going to be above that dotted line. So that highest point, like I said, represents both the mean and the median. It divides the data into two equal parts. Now, the a term that we use called the spread just tells us how wide the data is. So you can see over here, we have two other examples of graphs. The spread tells us essentially how close the values are together. So in the case of something like this, where we have something that's really tall and skinny, um, this is a small spread. So this tells us that we have a small standard deviation. So that just tells us that a lot of the values are grouped really, really close to that mean. If we have something like this that's a little bit wider of a spread, this one is going to have a larger standard deviation. Okay, so the wideness or the spread just tells us essentially what type of standard deviation we have as far as if we have a larger one or if we have a smaller one. Now, something that we have here called the empirical rule, this tells us what percentage of the data is within certain standard deviations, okay? So a lot of times when we have our graphs like this, the tick marks that you have along the x-axis are going to represent standard deviations. So we have one tick mark here, so that would be one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. Now, according to this empirical rule that we have, one standard deviation contains 60%, 68% of the data points. So out of all the data points we have, however many it is, 68% of those will be between one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above. So in total, this value from here to here represents 68% of the data. So if we cut that in half, because half of it's below, half of it's above, each of those two halves represents uh, 34%. So each of these sections will be 34% of all the data. Now we go down, two standard deviations contains 95% of the data. So if we go to two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above, that area covers 95% of all of the data points. Now for the next percentages I'm going to write down, I'm just going to put the sections that are in between negative one and negative two and between one and two. So those percentages are going to be 13 and a half. And now if you add all these percentages together, 13 and a half plus 34 plus 34 plus 13 and a half percent, all of those add together to give us that 95%. So we're just looking at each of those individual pieces. If we go one step further to three, above and three below, um, three standard deviations contains 99.7% of the data points. So almost all of it. So each of those percentages, we're getting even smaller now, each of these are going to be 2.35%. And once again, if we add all of these together, that would add together to give us that 99.7. Finally, we could break this up into more standard deviations, but these are just going to get a lot smaller every single time that we go. So I'm just going to write the final percentages. Everything that is bigger than 3% represents 0.15% of the data. And everything to the left of negative three is also 0.15%. So then if you add all of the values together, that adds up to give us a total of 100%. Now, when we have this normal distribution, these are asymptotic, which just means that they get closer and closer to that x-axis, but they never quite touch it. 
So this type of curve is what we're going to be using to help us to figure out some individual data points, which we'll see in a few examples. So one of the most important values that we're going to be calculating is something that is called the z-score. The z-score is essentially just a measure of how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. So for example, if we have a z-score of one, that just tells us that we are one standard deviation above the mean. If your standard deviation is negative 0.5, that tells us that we are half a standard deviation less than the mean. So the way that we're going to calculate this is z is going to equal your data point, which is just whatever value we have in the problem, subtract the mean or the average, and then we divide this by the standard deviation. Now the way that we're going to write this down is x is going to represent the data point, the Greek letter mu represents the mean, and then the Greek letter sigma represents the standard deviation. So z is going to equal x minus mu all over sigma. So this calculation is what we're going to be using to help us to actually get some of these data points. Okay, so let's look at one example where we calculate one of these z-scores. So let's say that we're taking a test in school and we get an A on the math test, so we get a 93%. Now let's say that the average, so mu, is equal to 82%, and let's say that sigma, or the standard deviation, is equal to 7. So we want to figure out what z-score we actually get. So to calculate these, x is going to be the 93, mu is going to be the 82, and then sigma is going to be the 7. So we're going to take these and plug them into the equation. So our z-score is going to equal 93 minus 82 divided by 7. Now we can just take this and plug this part here into the calculator, and that is going to give us approximately 1.57. Now, an additional thing that I'm going to have attached to this is a z-score table. The z-score tables essentially tell you what percentage um, or what the probability is of this occurring, okay? So in the chart, <clears throat> your z-scores are going to be along the x-axis, okay? Um, now, the way that the table is drawn is you have uh, one table with your negative values, one value with your positive values. We have a positive z value here, so we would look at the positive z values. Now, along that vertical line that we have, each of those are going to increase in increments of one tenth. So you're going to see 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, so on and so forth. So because we have 1.57, we're going to start by looking at 1.5, okay? Now, along the, um, the horizontal, along the top, um, that is where the, th uh, sorry, the um, hundreds place is going to be. So you'll see 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. So we're going to go over to 7 since we have 1.57. So the 1.5 will be the vertical side that you see on the table. The 7 will be the horizontal component that you see. And then you basically just find the value that is the intersection between those, which this corresponds to a probability of 0.9418. Now to turn this into a percentage, we just move the decimal place over twice. So this would be 94.18%, okay? Now this essentially represents what's called a percentile. So this essentially says if you get a 93 on a test where the average is 82 and the standard deviation is seven, you should be approximately in the percentile of 94.18. So that means that 94.18% of the people who take the test either got your score or a score that's less than yours. So then if we subtract this from 100, that would be um, approximately 5.82. So only 5.82% of people would get above the score that you got on the test, okay? So the z-score itself tells you how many standard deviations above or below the mean you are. We use the chart that will be attached um, as a PDF file um, we use that to figure out exactly what the percentile is that that happens, okay? So I hope that this first example made sense. We're going to do a couple of others. <clears throat> okay, so for this next example, we're going to be looking at another test. Um, in this case, mu is equal to 70, so the average was a little bit lower for this test. 
um, sigma is equal to 8, which once again is the standard deviation, um, the z-score for your particular test was negative 1.5. So that means that you got a score of one and a half standard deviations below the average. So we want to figure out what your score is. Now, there's going to be two different ways that we can calculate this. One way is pretty uh, simple and straightforward if you just have whole numbers like this, okay? The z-score, once again, represents the number of standard deviations um, above or below the mean. Since it's negative, it means it's below. So what we can do is we can actually multiply this by the standard deviation, and that will give us the specific number of points we are below the mean. So if we take uh, negative 1.5 and multiply this by 8, that's going to give us a score of negative 12. So that means that the score that we got on the test is 12 points below the average. Well, if we take the 70 and subtract 12 from that, that gives us a test score of a 58. So that represents the score that we would have gotten on the test. Now, this way is pretty straightforward if you just have nice, simple, whole, easy numbers. A lot of the ones that we're going to see moving forward are going to have decimals and stuff like that, so it's not going to be quite as easy to calculate. So I'm going to show you the way that we can do that um, just to make it a little bit easier. We're going to just use the formula that we talked about on uh, the previous part. So z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. Well, z is equal to negative 1.5. So this equals x minus mu, which was 70, over sigma, which was 8. Now, if we multiply the 8 to the other side to get rid of it, we have 8 times negative 1.5, which is negative 12, equals x minus 70. Now we just take the 70 and add it to the other side. If we do negative 12 plus 70, that also gives us a score of 58. So like I said, if you have nice, easy whole numbers, you can do it the way that I did initially. Um, most of what I'm going to do moving forward is going to be using the equation, since in the future we're going to see a lot of decimals and stuff. Okay? Now, we don't need to figure it out for this component, but let's say that the question also asks for the percentile. Well, in that case, we would look at the z-score table, like what we just did, and we would look at the score of negative 1.5. Now, since the table uses scores of a hundredth, you would just do negative 1.50. So you go to negative 1.5, and it would just be that first column that you see, and that would give you a percentile score of 6.68. So that says that 6.68% of people either got a 58, which was your score, or below. Everybody else, so the remaining 93.32%, everybody else got a score that was above what your score was. Okay, so I hope that this example made sense. Okay, so for example number three, this is something that we kind of just touched on. Um, they might just give us the z-score and just simply ask for the percentile. In that case, all we do is we just go straight through the table. There's no other calculations that we have to do. Now, the table uses increments of hundreds. Now, sometimes you will see that they go to three decimal places. In that case, these are just going to be kind of approximations. So 2.758, that's approximately 2.76. So we would just look at the z-score um, of approximately 2.76 on the table. And that should give us a... Uh, value of 0 0.9971, so that's going to be 99.71 percentile, okay? If we wanted to go backwards, if we have a score that's the 29th percentile and we want to see what that z-score is, well, all we would do is we would take that percent and turn it into a decimal. So we would go to 0 0.29. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look all throughout the table until we see one that is approximately 0.29, and then we will use that to find the z-score. So once again, sometimes these might not be exactly 100% precise. You might not see 0.29 exactly. So this is just going to be kind of a rough approximation. But when we see that value um, in the chart, um, we look at the x value, so the horizontal component and the vertical component, and those two should give us a z-score of negative 0 0.55. Okay, so it's in the negative portion of the chart. It'll be the negative 0.5 along the um, values that go up and down, 
and then the values that go left and right, that hundredth place will be 0 0.05. Okay, so I hope that these two made sense. Um, this next part I'm just gonna go through really quick. Um, it's not always going to be the case that your values are 100% even with the normal distribution. If we're talking about a perfect normal distribution, it will just be that bell-shaped curve that we had before, but there's a few other types that we might see. So a bi-model, that just means that we have two different peaks in the middle. Skewed left, that means that the majority of your values are on the left side, which actually means that the peak would be on the right side. Conversely, skewed towards the right, that means that the peak is going to be a little bit more towards the left. So these are values that you might come across in your homework. This is all that they mean. Um, you don't have to worry too terribly much about these though. Okay, so for this next example, we're going to break this up into a lot of different parts to show all of the different types of things that we can calculate. So we are going to say that the depth of snow that we have follows a normal distribution where the mean, so mu is equal to three inches of snow, and then uh, sigma, the standard deviation, is equal to 0.5 inches. So let's just say we're dealing with like a neighborhood or something like that, and we're calculating the depth of snow that each house has. So for part A, we want to find the values that are one standard deviation both above and below the mean. Well, this is similar to a few examples ago. If the average or the mean is three inches and each standard deviation is 0.5, well, to go one standard deviation above, we just take the average, which is the peak of the curve, and we just add the 0 0.5 to it. So that's one standard deviation. So one standard deviation above would be 3 plus 0 0.5, which is 3.5. Now to go one standard deviation below, we just take the mean and subtract the standard deviation instead of adding it. So 3 minus 0.5 gives us 2.5. Okay? Now for part B. So now we want to find the percent of the data points that fall between 2.5 and 3.5 inches. Well, those are what we just calculated here. So 2.5 inches is one standard deviation below, 3.5 is one standard deviation above the mean. So in the case of this, we're going to look at that empirical rule that we had from before. So we said that 68% of all of the data points fall within one standard deviation above and below. So 34% is between the mean and one standard deviation above, 34% is between the mean and one standard deviation below, which adds up to the 68%. So since this is exactly one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above, that tells us that 68% of the houses will fall under this category. So 68%. Now for part C, the middle 95% are between what values? So once again, this just follows that empirical rule. We said that two standard deviations above and below um, categorize the middle 95%. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate two standard deviations below and then two standard deviations above. And 95% of the values will fall between those two. So if we're looking at two standard deviations, we're just going to take our standard deviation and multiply it by two. So 0.5 times two, that just gives us one. So one inch is snow. So for the lower value that we want, we'll just take the average and subtract that value of one. So three minus one gives us two. And then conversely, we will add one to our standard deviation. So three plus one, that's going to give us four. So the middle 95% of values will fall between two inches of snow and four inches of snow. Okay, so I'm going to erase these parts here. We're going to do a few other uh, calculations where we're still dealing with the same type of problem. Okay, so for this next group of questions that we're going to look at, for part D, we want to find what percent of values are between two and three, what percent are between two and 3.5, and then what percent are below four. When we're dealing with these types of calculations where we want to figure out a percent between something and something else, or a percent that's less than or greater than, a lot of times I will actually go through and fill out the values of the normal curve that we have. So the very maximum that we had, that is the mean, which is three inches. Now, each point that we have, we went up to three standard deviations above and below. That's what we did before. <clears throat> so each of those tick marks will represent one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. 
So since the standard deviation is 0.5, one above would be 3.5, then 4, then 4.5. Then over here, we would go 3 minus 0 0.5, so 2.5 to 1.5. So that would be three standard deviations below. Now you should have this part written down, but I'm just going to rewrite those percentages in there. Do all my dotted lines. So we said for the first two that each of those values were 34%. The next two outsides individually were 13.5%. The next ones that we had were 2.35%. And then the final endpoints that we had were 0.15%. Okay, so that's what we had where all of the values added together to give us that 100% that we were talking about before. So what percent are between two and three? So two is right here, three is right here. Now, since we have all the percentages written in there, all we have to do is just add up the percentages between each of the two endpoints. So between two and 2.5, that percent was 13 and a half, and then between two and a half and three, that percent was 34. Well, if we take these two and add them together, that is going to give us 47.5. So 47.5% of the values fit between these two. So then between two and three and a half, so we're still starting at two, but now we're going to three and a half. Well, we'll do the same thing. So between two and two and a half, that percentage was 13.5. Between two and a half and three, that was 34%. And then between three and three and a half, that would also be 34%. So now for this one, if we take all of these values and add them together, that's going to give us 81.5%. So 81.5% of the values would fall between two inches of snow and three and a half inches of snow. So now for the last one, we have below four. So four is going to be the maximum that we have. We want everything that's below four. So from four to three and a half, that was 13.5. Between three and a half and three, that was 34. Three and two and a half was also 34. Then 13 and a half. Then 2.35. And then finally that last is the 0.15. So then once again, we just take all of these values that we see here, we add them together, you can just throw them into the calculator, but that gives us 97.5%. Okay, now a shortcut that we can do for these ones, we know that we would have to add up all of these values over here. Another option that we have is we could add the values that are bigger than four and just subtract that from 100%. So if we took the 2.35 and the 0.15 that are both above, that adds together to give us 2.5%. Well, if we take 100% and subtract 2.5%, that gives us 97.5%, okay? So that's something that's going to come back into play in the next example. Okay, so now we're going to be doing another story problem. This is going to be our last example. So the lifespan of an MP3 player follows a normal distribution the average lifespan is three and a half years. The standard deviation is 0.6 years. At this point in time, we've had it for two years. So most of the time when you calculate this, this is kind of the format that you will see this written in. So for the first part, we want to find P of X is less than two. That just means find the probability or the percent that it will last, in this case, less than two years, okay? So the first thing that we are going to do is we, um, for these types of calculations, we always need to start with the z-score. So remember, z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. So in this case, since we've had it for two years, x is going to equal two, okay? That's also the number that we have right here in the problem. So z will equal two minus 3.5 over sigma, which is 0.6. Now, we just take this and plug it into the calculator and that should give us a value of negative 2.5. So that tells us that this value that we have 
is two and a half standard deviations below the average or below the mean. Now from here, this is where we, we go to the z-score uh, table to figure out what that probability is. So we go to the z value of negative 2.5 and we look at that probability. Well, that probability that we see there is 0 0.62%. Okay, so there's a 0.62% uh, chance um, that the MP3 player that we have would last less than two years, okay? Now, we could also say that if it ended up dying at that two year mark, that that MP3 player would be in the 0.62 percentile. Only 0.62% of all the MP3 players have a lifespan of that value or less, okay? Now let's find the probability that X is greater than four. Now, anytime we're looking at the z-square um, value on the table, when we compare this back to that normal distribution that we have, in the previous one, the z-score that we had was negative 2.5. So here's our average. We were negative two and a half, so we're right here, standard deviations below. Now, the probability is essentially the area under this curve, but it's always the area that is less than, so it's always the area that's on the left side. So this area that we have here would be that 0.62. For this one, since we have the probability that x is greater than 4, this is that very last part that I was talking about in the previous example. Um, anytime that we want to find um, a smaller probability, of what we can do is we can just do 100% or 1 minus this individual probability. So anytime you see the probability that X is bigger than something, this will always equal one minus the probability of X is less than that same number. Okay, and it always has to be X is less than in order for us to be able to use the table. Okay, so we always have to make sure to change that. So, oops, not two, it should be four. Excuse me, because four is the value that we had right here. So we'll calculate the z-score now with an x value of 4. So we would go 4 minus 3.5 over 0 0.6, and that gives us a z-value of 0.83. Now we go back to the table again, and that probability that we have, kind of running out of room. So the probability that x is less than 4, so the probability that corresponds to that z value of 0.83 is 0 0.7967, or 79.67%. So now if we take these two values and subtract them, that is going to give us 0 0.2033. So there's approximately a 20.33% chance that it will last more than 4 years. Okay. So for the next part, I'm going to erase this part that we have here, and we'll move on to the next couple of parts. Okay, so these will be the final two parts that we have. So for this part, we want to find the probability that x is between 2 and 4. So that it will be bigger than 2 years, but less than 4. In this case, of what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these two probabilities, and we're going to subtract them. Okay, so we're going to find the probability that x is less than 4 and subtract the probability that x is less than 2. Now the reason that we do it this way is once again thinking back to the curve that we have. The probability that x is 4, so that is somewhere over here. The probability that x is 2, that's somewhere over here. If we do the probability that x is less than 4, that means the probability of this, so all of this area. Okay? But we don't want this part right here. We want everything that's bigger than 2 but less than 4. So we need to subtract this portion out. Well, this portion is the probability that x is less than 2. Okay? Now, the probabilities of 4 and 2, these are just those two probabilities that we found in the previous two problems. Okay? So the probability that x is less than 4, that was that 0.7967 that we got from the table, okay? <clears throat> the probability that x is less than two, that was the 0 0.0062, or the 0.62%. So now if we take these values and if we subtract them, 
that gives us 0.7905, or 79.05%. So there's a 79.05% chance that it will last between two and four years. Okay? Now for the final one, um, the specific MP3 player we have is in the 30th percentile. We want to figure out the specific value, so what the lifespan of the specific MP3 player is. So since we are given the percentile, we need the z-score. So that means we go to the table to get what the z-score is. So we're looking at a probability of 0 0.30, and so that corresponds to approximately a value of negative 0.515. Now for this one, once again, this is just kind of a rough approximation. It's somewhere between negative 0.51 uh, and negative 0.52. So therefore I just kind of split the difference and call it negative 0.515, okay? As long as you're kind of in that ballpark, like I said, this is a rough approximation, so it's not going to be perfect, but you should still be within a few decimal places, okay? <clears throat> um, this is something that I'll be checking on your homework. So if you end up getting the wrong answer and the correct answer ends up being like 0.1 off or something, I will see that on your homework. I will mark that as correct. So you don't have to worry about that. So this is the z-score that we have. And the z-score is equal to x minus mu, which is 3.5, over sigma, which is 0 0.6. Now we did a calculation very similar to this earlier. We're going to multiply both sides by 0.6. So we multiply these two, and then whatever value we get there, we will just add over the 3.5. All of that goes into the calculator, and we get x is equal to 3.191, and in this case, it's years. Okay, so that is the lifespan of um, the specific MP3 player that we had, so just a little bit over three years. Now, a lot of times you can kind of compare this to the mean and the standard deviation to make sure that your answer somewhat makes sense. Since we were in the 30th percentile, that's less than half, so we expect that our answer should be below this value that we had here, okay? The z-score that we had was approximately negative 0.5, so we knew that we were about a half a standard deviation below. Well, half of one standard deviation or half of 0.6 is about 0.3, we were approximately 0.3 below that mean that we had. So that's kind of a quick check that you can do just to make sure that your answer somewhat makes sense, okay? So I hope that each of these examples that we did made sense to you guys. Um, if you do have additional questions, as always, please feel free to reach out.